In this lecture, we continue with examining the beauty of the revelation regarding the mother of Jesus as it's contained in the New Testament. And specifically here, we're now going to speak about the infancy narratives of the gospel according to St. Matthew, uh, the truth about Mary, but we're also going to speak uh, to some significant degree about the truth of St. Joseph. Part of the revelation of Mary is that she's married. And so it's relevant and appropriate that we'd also incorporate some of the insights uh, that are revealed in terms of the reality and the virtue of St. Joseph. So we begin with the what is called the betrothal of Mary to Joseph. <coughs> Excuse me. This is Matthew uh, 118. And then the what's called the ordeal of Joseph concerning the virgin birth of Mary. In, in other words, that Mary is indeed pregnant when Joseph sees Mary after the time at Ancrim. Let's go through that with some explanation. First of all, betrothal from a Jewish context. Betrothal is not the same as a engagement uh, as we would understand it in a contemporary society. Betrothal in Jewish law was step one of marriage. In fact, uh, even contemporary Jewish sources will identify that if a Jewish couple seek to get out of a traditional betrothal in a traditional understanding of Judaism, there has to be a writ of divorce because betrothal is indeed step one of marriage. So step two would constitute when the husband, uh, anytime soon after, up to uh, even a year of, of time, Step two is the husband brings the wife into his home, which is now prepared for the wife. And so we have the revelation of the betrothal, and in a period of time after, after the betrothal, but before part two of marriage, when Mary is brought into the home of Joseph, the Annunciation takes place. And so in this context, we have Joseph, and again, remember that as soon as the Annunciation takes place, Soon after, Mary goes to the hill country and she serves Elizabeth for a, a period of uh, some three months or so. After which time, Mary returns home and it would be logical to say that Mary is showing with child. This is her fourth month. So she's showing. Now, classically, there's three different responses, uh, at least theories, uh, regarding what St. Joseph does uh, upon Mary's return, and he becomes aware that she's with child. The first, uh, which is by far the minority uh, opinion and has not really been championed by anyone significant in the church, is that Joseph thinks Mary has sinned and is trying to get rid of her as soon as possible. That's option one. Uh, but indeed, that doesn't stand strong in terms of a, of a real option because according to Jewish law, Joseph has two options. One is to have a public divorce, which could incur uh, death by stoning for Mary, because the implication of the public divorce would be that Mary is responsible for her unborn child. Joseph is free from responsibility, and therefore all the blame, all the fault would be on Mary. Uh, Joseph does not opt for this. Joseph, even in early consideration, is opting to put her away quietly, Scripture says, which means he's not going to jeopardize Mary. But to do so, he has to uh, kind of take on partial guilt himself for the unborn child. That's what happens when you don't uh, exercise the option of stoning. The implication is that you too are at part responsible for this child. So that's option one. Option two is that Mary, excuse me, that Joseph was so uh, in awe based on his own humility of what was taking place here that he realized that Jesus was the Messiah, that Mary was the mother of the Messiah, and he chose to excuse himself from such a historically sublime event. Uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, for example, would hold that position. The third option, which I'm going to confess I think is the most correct option and the option that's, that's received the most support, 
is what uh, the Jesuit theologian Suarez called uh, was stupefaction, which is a, is a word of saying Joseph was stupefied by two realities that he could not reconcile. One is that his, his wife is pregnant. Remember, part one of marriage has already happened. And she is pregnant, and number two, he knows he's not the father. And he can't deny the holiness of Mary. He knows of the holiness of Mary, and he appreciates the holiness of Mary, but he can't deny the child. So these realities don't seem to mix and merge. And so as, as some of the fathers would say, you know, Joseph aged 10 days, uh, ten years in these three days, and others say he grayed in the temple over the, 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 the perplexity, uh, the confusion of this. And then, of course, what we do know, which is revealed, is that the angel comes and clarifies. Joseph is still the just man because Joseph, and by the way, just uh, in Scripture and especially in the Old Testament doesn't mean just giving one their due, as the definition of justice would say. It's a, uh, it's a synonym for holiness, for righteousness, the righteous man, the holy man, the just man. Joseph, even before the angel comes to save the day with the revelation, opts the sacrificial uh, answer regarding uh, the response to Mary, which would include his own guilt for something he knew he was not guilty for. That's to put her away quietly. So he is the just and virtuous man. And we'll see as this continues that there's no human being, there's no man, of course, short of Our Lady, uh, but in this case it, it will cancel itself out as you'll see. No man that better is an icon that better exemplifies the virtues of God the Father than St. Joseph. Why? Because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, God never gives us, gives us a task that he doesn't give us the corresponding grace to fulfill the task. And Joseph was called to be the virginal father of Jesus, as St. Augustine would call him. Not the biological father, but the true virginal father of Jesus. And so God the Father would would embellish Joseph with the graces and virtues so that as much as any man could represent the Father in heaven, Joseph would to Jesus. More on this in just a moment. Let's continue with the revelations of Our Lady and, of course, uh, St. Joseph in the Gospel of St. Matthew. We go to <clears throat> three events. First of all, the arrival of the Magi. This is Matthew 2.11. Uh, the Magi who, quote, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. The next verse, and I want to take these three together because there's a similar theme that connects the three. The next verse, the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt. This is Matthew 2, 12, 13, <clears throat> where Joseph again was instructed by a dream to, quote, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Followed by the return into Israel, where Joseph is again instructed, quote, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead, Matthew 2.20. What's significant about these three together is that even in the message of the angel, the, the, the formulation is, take the child and his mother. He doesn't say, take your child and your wife, which would seem to imply a biological fatherhood, he says rather, take the child and his mother, which implies and, and, and further reveals the virginity of Mary and the miraculous nature of the conception and birth of Jesus Christ. Now, there's more with these. First of all, going back to the Magi. The Magi, the Magi these, these remarkably inspired kings, come and they adore Jesus. You really have you know, some of the early beginnings of Eucharistic adoration, of course, it's not under the species of the Eucharist, but the Eucharist is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so here you have the Magi beginning the adoration of Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Uh, they're second only to, I mean, perhaps the shepherds to some degree, but, but clearly second only to Mary and Joseph's adoration of Jesus from the beginning of the Nativity. You also have in the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt, one of the seven sorrows of Mary. So again, imagine that you know, the FBI 
in its local branch is after your child. Their goal is to kill your child. Imagine the sufferings that you would experience as a parent. Uh, how many times does Mary have to look over her shoulder as, as she and Joseph are, are, are going into Egypt? Uh, and how long do they worry about it once they're in Egypt? Uh, it, it's not that far of a distance. Could it be the FBI and the CIA that go international and, and, and try to fulfill the, the death wish of Herod? This is intense, deep suffering. And Mary experiences this. And notice that the angel comes not to incarnate wisdom, not to the seat of wisdom, but to fallen yet redeemed Joseph. Why? The angel comes to the head of the family. And Joseph will always be, and was always, the head of the holy family. This is a God-given structure where the father is the head, that's authority and service, the mother is the heart, bringing love and unity and communion throughout the rest of the family, and the children are called to obey and form part of this domestic church. That's not going to change. It doesn't matter how many sociological experiments we want to try. The father is head, the mother is heart, and the children are called to enter that communion. Of course, it is true, as Pius XI says back in 1930 in Kanubi, if the father fails his responsibility as head and leaves, then the mother has to become both head and heart. But that's not the way, the, uh, the way God wants it. And it certainly wouldn't be that kind of error and, and infidelity in the Holy Family. Joseph is the head, and God the Father acknowledges that by sending the angel in instructions to protect Joseph. And also reminds us, it's not based on level of holiness. Of the three, Joseph uh, ranks third after Jesus and Mary. He still has the responsibility to be head of his family. So it's not based on holiness, it's based on vocation. And that's the vocation of every single father to be the protector and provider, the authority and service for his family. Now, we also see with the return of the Holy Family into Israel, the angel comes to Joseph, but Joseph also uses his own prudence and perhaps wisdom as the Holy Spirit is guiding him to avoid a, a, a successor of Herod who also has uh, a potential for damage and danger to the Holy Family. So that's how much God trusts St. Joseph in this process. It's, it's, it's extremely profound and, and tells us much about St. Joseph. As St. Augustine would say, at least we can extrapolate from what St. Augustine does say about St. Joseph, there's a beautiful little maxim. And the maxim is, what Joseph was to Jesus, Joseph is to the rest of the mystical body. Let me say that again. What Joseph was to Jesus while Jesus was on earth, Joseph is to the rest of the mystical body. He is our spiritual foster father. He is a spiritual, virginal, but true father in the order of grace. That's why in the middle of the 19th century, the popes proclaimed Joseph to be the patron of the universal church. I, I remember always what's called the challenge of St. Teresa of Avila. So, Teresa of Avila, the doctor of the church on prayer, was extremely, she was on the point of death, and she said doctors couldn't help her, so she went to St. Joseph. St. Joseph cured her. Uh, she named a, a majority of the Carmelite monasteries after St. Joseph after that point, and she, she proposed what could be called the, the, the challenge of St. Joseph. She said, if you have not experienced, if you have not experienced the intercession, the power of St. Joseph's intercession, ask him for something important. Give him the opportunity in your life to manifest the power of, an, of his intercession and you will not be disappointed. And so, I encourage you to do that. I've done it and I've seen and, and been awed at the intercessory power of St. Joseph. Remember, in the church, as we'll talk about, Latria is that worship exclusive to God. Dulia is the reverence due to the communion of saints. Hyperdulia, as we will define and, and explain, is that unique level of devotion that is appropriate for the mother of God. But within that category of doula, there's, there's something, dulia, there's something called proto-dulia, proto-dulia. That means first among dulia. And both Leo XIII and St. John Paul II have referred to Joseph being the greatest saint 
after Mary, therefore receiving this protodulia. And this is because what Joseph was to Jesus, he is to us. So Joseph is second only to Mary in the order of the intercession of the saints regarding our needs. And especially in this age of father deprivation, it would seem that we would especially turn to St. Joseph in need uh, and, and, and in fulfillment of our temporal and our spiritual needs. Remember also, St. Joseph was a very practical man, and he had to take care of the Holy Family in a foreign land, and he had to get a job in a foreign land. These are all difficult things, especially in a land that's not particularly fond of your race based on something that happened a little bit before called the Exodus. Joseph understands the challenge of the working man and of the needs of, of all individuals in the temporal order. And that's why, uh, as uh, we hear from the Pharaoh, uh, the ite ad Joseph, go to Joseph. This is Pharaoh's encouragement to the people of Egypt during the time of the famine. Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph, who foreshadows the New Testament Joseph, takes care of all the people because he's made provision. Well, that anticipates St. Joseph, who is the foster father of the church. He's, he's the universal patriarch, uh, which again, has a, and bespeaks a intercession second only to Our Lady. So, so we want to ite ad Joseph. We want to go to St. Joseph in our spiritual lives. We're going to uh, pause here, and this will complete the infancy narratives and in our next lecture, we're going to talk about a couple of the extraordinary revelations of regarding Our Lady in the Gospel of John, as well the, as the other New Testament references, including St. Paul, the Acts, even, and finally the book of Revelation. Thank you.